Okay. Then hello everyone um, who is already joining. I think this is also being recorded and, and streamed. Um, so we are discussing today with the European Forum on the question of the climate after Trump. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? The European Forum is, uh, well, a forum of progressive politicians in, in Europe, um, from green to left uh, uh, politicians. And I think it's really good to have this, this conversation also on this level, because together we can achieve a lot today. Uh, I will be here a little bit the host and moderate this. I'm Michael Bloss. Um, I'm a member of, um, of the European Parliament from the German Green Party. Um, I'm uh, sitting on the Environmental Committee and the Committee for uh, Industry and Energy. And I was for the Greens, the person who has been just dealing with the climate law. Um, so this big framework law um, on, on climate uh, issues. Um, and it may be even more important, uh, we have uh, with us Eva Garcia Sempere. I'm very bad in my Spanish, I'm sorry, but uh, fortunately there is translation. Um, she um, was a member of the Congress of Deputies uh, for the province of Malaga, and they're the president of the Ecologi Ecological Transition Committee. Now she works as the federal coordinator of the environment and ecology area for the Andalusian Municipality Fund for International Solidarity. And um, she has been the president of the Association of the United Left. And we have Olivia Lazard with us. She's a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe, um, focuses on geopolitics of climate. Really interested to hear more about this, the transition. Um, 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 that comes from climate change, risks and conflicts. She has been very active also in the whole field of conflict, conflict prevention. Um, and she has even set up her own consultancy firm on peace um, and is still active in, in conflict zones. Um, so maybe let me give you a, just a brief little uh, input on where we are with the European side of after Trump, and then we go into the debate and uh, what this um, year will bring. I think it's a very important year, and we will have the climate conference in Glasgow. Um, and in this climate conference, actually, all, mem all members um, of the Paris Agreement, they should say how much CO2 they're going to reduce in order to meet the Paris Agreement goals, which is going to or limiting global warming, global heating to 1.5 degrees um, and staying well below two degrees. Um, and so if everything that all countries in the world put together in their plans, that should be at below, very well below two degrees and going to the 1.5 degree path. So this is what we should achieve this year. Now, unfortunately, we are not there yet. Um, and one of the like, once that is like the one of the actors that is moving but is not moving fast enough is actually the European Union. Um, as I said, we we just we have this green deal. So the idea, as Ursula von der Leyen, the president of uh, the EU Commission, always says, it's the man on the moon project for Europe. So this big thing, and Europe should become uh, the first climate neutral continent. Now they are contested actually after Trump by the US. Um, and that sounds all very nice, but then if you look into the detail, actually what is inside is not as promising as if you only look into the headlines. We see that um, by first uh, an agricultural policy um, and agriculture is the biggest budgetary point from the European Union. And in this agricultural policy, there's basically no uh, uh, um, requirements on climate uh, and fighting the, the climate crisis. So that was already a failure. Then we had a second thingy. This is um, the taxonomy for green financial products. So it's kind of a, you know, like a, a climate uh, a label, green label for financial products. And here there was the idea that gas and, and, and nuclear is still um, supported. And now we have the climate law. And the climate law of the European Union, that's basically the central orientation point for the Green Deal. It says how much CO2 
should be reduced in the next 10 years, in the next nine years until 2030. So our 2030 goal, how much CO2 should we have reduced um, is uh, inside the climate law. And um, the, the, the number that we have put in is actually real emission reduction of 52.8%. That does not say you probably a lot because there's a lot of percentages, but basically what scientists have calculated that the target of the European Union would bring us to a world that is around three degrees warmer, that is already much too hot. Um, and this is really a huge problem um, for, you know, like our, our biodiversity. Um, we see already there's uh, wildfires in, in, in all over the world. We have a fire ring. We see in, in, in Europe, um, in Germany, our, our forests are dying. So three degrees is a no-go. Um, but this is basically what is in the climate law of the European Union now. Um, actually, this is also the reason why we Greens in the European Parliament will vote against this uh, climate law because we say, look, this is the last chance and we need to have something that is compatible with the Paris Agreement. Uh, so um, uh, we cannot say yes to something that is not compatible with it. Um, and uh, But now on the 14th of July, there will be a huge legislative package with many laws. Um, it's called the Fit for 55 package. Um, and there we will try to improve really the, the situation and, and make it in the implementation um, so that we will reach still the Paris Agreement goals. So, but it's a long, it's a long uh, uh, shot. Um, we have to do it. Uh, but currently, when we look into what happens in Europe, Europe, the European Union is always uh, like saying that they are the big climate leader. But if you look into detail, they really do. Then unfortunately, they are not. So um, is that already uh, like a sign for that uh, the next climate um, conference will fail? I hope not, but we are going to discuss this uh, now with our distinguished guests. So maybe um, I can ask Olivia first to give your uh, ideas on the question, what is with this year? What will happen at the, United, uh, at the next climate conference in Glasgow? Do we really now see a tipping point um, in, in climate politics after Trump? And what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? I'm happy to listen to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, maybe I'll start by uh, situating where we're at with the Biden administration first and foremost after Trump. There's been a lot of um, enthusiasm with the election of President Biden and, um, and a sigh of relief in the European Union and across the world, including on the matter of climate action. And there's a bit of a similar story to the one that you were explaining with the European Union. We're very happy that President Biden is um, in the driving seat compared to President Trump. But we can't, we have to um, better qualify what climate leadership means for the US. And um, we know that indeed, you know, there is a recommitment of the US to multilateralism and therefore demonstrable efforts to, uh, COP, to you know, on the road to COP26. One of the key events of the year was the Earth Day Summit in April, where Biden, Pre President Biden essentially with John Kerry and Anthony Blinken managed to really sort of give an opening chapter to the conference, which already gave us a taste of how there is a push towards raising pledges. We're not yet having you know, a sense of implementation plans, which uh, is going to be important, but we are seeing an effort at really engaging world partners, private sector actors, um, old age allies, including in the European Union, in order to really sort of show up at COP26, at the G7, at Kunming and, um, and other events on the road um, to, to, to Glasgow. Um, the biggest push that we're seeing in terms of the US is very much at home. And um, there is a very specific reason for that. Um, there are two actually. One is obviously that President Biden needed to convince both some progressive wings within the US 
the ones that are usually pushing far more for climate ambition and climate implementation plans. And at the same time, he needed to convince a Republican base, um, which is more refractory to a number of different changes associated to a shift in terms of political economy towards climate transitions. Um, so on the one hand, there is this understanding, which is very much the narrative today, that climate policy needed to be employment policy, economic regeneration policy within the US and therefore investments in infrastructure and other things. And then there is the second part, which connects to the, um, you know, the, the democratic and sort of domestic agenda with the foreign one, which is a fundamental fear within the US, which was already there in the Trump era, that China will actually leapfrog both um, the US and the, U the European Union in terms of the so-called fourth industrial revolution, where essentially there is a, a sort of mixing of different agendas. Climate transitions and digital transitions actually rely on the type of materials that are readily accessible on Chinese territory for the most part. And um, where China has developed a considerable com comparative advantage in terms of making itself central to climate transitions and to the future, the technological future of work, of mobility, of innovation, um, and the US and the EU have fallen largely behind um, for the last 15 years and are waking up to this problem. And it's therefore sort of contributing to the way in which climate transitions are planned. So the guise of this climate leadership in the US, there is very much still an America first policy, which is not to be judged. Um, it is a necessity actually to move the climate um, agenda forward within the US, otherwise it would stay stuck, but it does have implications for the type of commitments that the US and the EU together can, 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 can have. So there is very much of a focus on how to reindustrialize um, the US, on how to really invest in a number of different industrial era, areas that are associated with technological innovation, which also means that there is a discourse within the US of techno solutionism. And we've heard, you know, John Kerry, for example, say, well, you know, science tells us that in any case, we're going to have to solve at least, you know, 50% of our emissions problem with technology, which in a lot of places rings, including in climate scientist um, circles, rings very hollow and very hypocritical because first of all, technologies are not in place today. They're not yielding demonstrable results. Um, but at the same time, there's this notion that climate change is one of the ecological crises that we're facing. And to an ecological crisis, we also need to have ecological solutions, processes and answers rather than technological ones. Um, and the reality, and I'll, I'll stop on that regarding the US, is that we are still facing an American uh, policy and political landscape where there is considerable political polarization on the topic of climate, uh, um, of climate change. Even though there's been progress over the last 10 years, it remains a very contentious issue. And there are still a number of issues regarding the influence of fossil um, subsidies and, and uh, lobbies on the way in which political discourses are crafted and in the way that votes are taken to Congress. This political polarization is uh, putting a lot of constraints on the type of ambitions that President Biden can have and is going to possibly limit even further their margin of maneuver past the moment of the midterm elections within a year and a half. So this is something that we need to keep in mind and this is why the EU remains for all of its weaknesses and faults, um, it needs to remain one of the beacons committed reliably, constantly at the time to the notion of climate ambition and adapting to science, responding to science, which is why, as Michael, you were saying, this is particularly important also to be very honest with ourselves about where we're at. Um, about uh, two weeks ago, the World Meteorological Organization told us that we were at, we were headed as early as 2025 for a 1.5 uh, degree Celsius increase, which is going to be supposed to be temporary, but we're headed there in about three years. It tells us essentially that even climate models are based on probability. 
and that the timeline of policy at the moment remains extremely slow compared to the actual burning emergency that we're facing and on which we need to accelerate and which requires indeed a whole of society transformation, which we're not seeing. The, the, the best sort of prototype that we have is indeed the Green Deal. It's still not there. And you've mentioned, for example, the inconsistencies regarding the agricultural policy, for example, the, the tensions that exist between the common agricultural policy and the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies of the Green Deal. This is a massive issue which we're going to need to solve within um, the EU, but at least we're having, we're having those conversations. There are many conversations in the US that remain profoundly taboo regarding a whole of economy and a whole of society transformation. And we are still going to need, and this is going beyond COP because we need to situate afterwards the conversation very much on, on COP, we are going to need very quickly to move past the green growth kind of narrative. We may need some green growth in some sectors, but we actually need to start researching, investigating, and piloting other types of economic um, tra trajectories, essentially, that really do not overshoot on planetary boundaries, not just CO2 emissions, right? We're talking about the hydrological cycle, we're talking about biodiversity, we're talking about stratospheric issues and things like this. So all of this, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not standing up to the plate. In terms of COP26, I mean, uh, and now this is the moment when we're uh, going into relative progress rather than absolute progress. It's already good that we've had a sort of moratorium on uh, funding for coal abroad um, by G7 members. This is something that is going to, it is already a stepping stone towards something more. And it is going to result in isolating more the economies of the world, including Australia and China, that are still funding coal overseas and that shouldn't. Um, technically, we should go much beyond coal. We should include gas, we should be, include oil, we should include a number of different fossil um, energies. We are moving also closer to climate risk disclosure for private sector actors um, with discussions between the US and, and the EU on this. This is also something that the, pri the private sector is eagerly waiting for, particularly in the financial sector, and which is going to be very important. We need to keep an eye on that. And that is going to lead to a lot more discussions on how do we monitor, how, we do, how do we enforce, how is it also sort of, you know, relevant for uh, diplomacy, for development and things like this. Um, but there are some things that are still lagging, you know, some of the of the difficulties between the EU and the US is around the carbon pricing, the US because of politicization is very much refractory to carbon pricing, which effectively still means that it can, you know, still fund, um, uh, you know, fossil extraction. Um, there are some issues regarding, therefore, the carbon levies, as we, you know, in, in the EU, we're talking about the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which might come into effect as early as 2023, um, and there needs to be a lot more diplomatic discussions around this. Um, so there are, there, there is some progress, but largely the message is we're not moving fast enough and, and one of the key issues in COP26 is also going to be a focus on developing partners and this is something that I look forward to addressing in the discussion. That's really interesting because if America is American first um, policy and uh, it's uh, Europe or the Green, the green Deal is um, um, a European, actually it's a green growth it's labeled like this and it's also like a europe first uh, strategy then what happens to the rest of the world but um that maybe is for the discussion now um eva over to you are you i hope you are still there because now i don't actually see anymore oh she was here just until uh, one minute ago, but unfortunately, somehow now Eva is gone. That is unfortunate. Um, maybe I can just explain briefly to, to um, all of you listeners. I guess you know after one and a half years of pandemic already how things work on Zoom, but um, there is a raise your hand button. Um, down there so um, if you want to contribute to the discussion you can just click it and then i see it and i can actually get you into the debate and there is a question and answering tool so um please um this is a debate so if you have questions 
uh, write your questions inside the uh, question and answer tool or raise your hand and then we can open the debate. I think we had heard already very interesting thoughts about what is going on in the US internally. So can we, so how much actually is the Biden administration, so the area after Trump, um, well, the voters that voted for Trump, they're not yet gone. So that has a lot of influence still um, on, on uh, the behavior of the US. Actually, I was uh, very much interested in understanding a bit more about the leapfrogging frogging of China. Um, because then on the one hand, uh, you see them having very ambitious um, targets, but then on the other hand, still the emissions are growing and growing. And in times of crisis, they actually reverted back to, um, to a more fossil-based developing path um, when you look into transport sector, but also the energy sector. Um, so not sure, my argument was always like that, that Europe has to be careful that it will be overtaken by, by China. Um, and then I think it's, it's also very important, um, especially in this room, to debate a little bit about who pays for the transition. So like, who are the ones that, I mean, because it costs something, it's also, I mean, it is um, investment, but it also is its cost. So the difference um, between, for instance, if you put, uh, as an example, if you, if in the transport sector, we have two different um, uh, models. The one model is that we say, we use regulatory policy and put an end to the fossil engine by the year 2030, for instance. Um, and then uh, car companies will have to deal with it and invest into changing their, um, the, the, well, their car manufacturing facilities, or you put a price on uh, CO2 emissions that is then paid by the consumers uh, at the fueling station, where then um, fuel gasoline becomes very expensive and that should push uh, consumers to change to electric cars or uh, or um, public transport. So two different uh, strategies to get to the same uh, uh, target. Now the one is actually putting the costs on all of the uh, society and especially um, well people with uh, not so big incomes will have to pay a bigger share of their income um, than for the transition or put the, um, the costs um, to the companies when they do their investments. So I think that's that's really important also to, to understand, and especially on the European level, when we are now he heading for the, um, the this huge um, um, laws on the implementation of the climate goal, which is, for instance, the question, how high should be the CO2 price be and who pays it for it then? Um, which is the question, like if we go for renewable energy, um, um, yeah, who, well, how, how much renewable energy will we still see? Um, will we actually favor or disfavor um, small scale, um, how do you say, like people's based community level um, energy production, or it will still be kind of the big energy producers that, that are govern, that govern the, the whole energy transition when it's about um, um, houses, how do we build houses um, in, in terms of um, insulation, who pays for the insulation? Is it then, I mean, in Germany, it's anyway not achievable, well, not able anymore for normal people to buy houses, but will it be then more expensive for, for people to, um, to buy their own houses and will they have to pay higher rent? So all of these questions I think are um, very important. And as still the, I mean, the Green Deal, you said it's, it's a really important one. And I, I, I agree that it is going forward, but still you can actually see that is, it's a, it, it from a commission president that comes from the right wing side of the political spectrum, because it's first, it's very much uh, on uh, um, targeted towards growth and it's, um, and it's then targeted towards technological development. Uh, the whole social side of it, what are the social implications um, how is it, uh, how is the, the just transition going to be fought? that is not so much in the focus um, of, of the Green Deal. And I think if you uh, compare it with the Green Deal that is putting, put forward in the US, that's also one of the main um, differences. Now, I was talking a lot to see if Eva comes back, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. so I will stop now. And I see that Alberta, Alberto, um, uh, 
he um, just asked to uh, record the seminar and we will still waiting for Eva. And um, for the time being, please, if you have questions, raise your hand or put them into the um, um, question and answering uh, tool. And for the time being, Olivia, I would like to come, come back to you also with all of this, this um, interesting thoughts. Um, and if you, if you look into also like what happens in the US, how do you, judge it in terms of like social ecological transition is that because also it's a huge investment uh, thing it favors I don't know who actually but um, is, is it this kind of social transition that we need to see or, or who is who is benefiting from it and maybe the second question that you already brought in before what happens to the rest of the world to the developing countries um, to the global south um, in this transition because one of the arguments is you no know, like if they cannot sell their raw materials anymore. They are even worse off. So I'll start very quickly on the first one. Um, I'm, I'm not American, so I wouldn't, you know, be the most legitimate voice to speak about, you know, the uh, the, the complete relevance and adequacy of um, of the Biden plan. What I do, however, admire and um, and envy to a certain extent um, is the fact that the Biden administration has profoundly understood, especially in the wake of the George Floyd um, and Black Lives Matter movement, that the climate conversation is fundamentally rooted also in the need for environmental, social and racial justice. Um, and the fact that they're paying attention to this a uh, very complex conversation and it is showing in the way that they're talking about the, the infrastructure plan. It is showing in the way that they are um, looking at the type of um, at the type of impact that climate disasters will have um, on communities around the US, noticing that the most vulnerable are more likely to be more impacted and more left behind. They're, they also do notice that the financial system or the insurance system or the real estate system tends to actually sort of keep um, race, racial communities outside of comfortable, healthy living conditions. These are really, really tough conversations to have. Um, and they, they bring in a lot of, of, uh, of nuance in the way that policy and implementation plans should be um, implemented. So there is an attention to um, this notion of inclusive transition forward. At the same time, and let's be very clear once again, um, this techno-solutionism at the highest levels, and we saw it even in, on the Earth Day Summit, you know, like there were some sessions that were facilitated, for example, by the likes of Bill Gates who uh, published a, a, you know, a book recently, which uh, for all of Bill Gates' achievements is also very much missing the point around the fact that because we're facing an e a series of ecological crises where, which are actually the products of political economic systems, we need to go to the drivers rather than look for the type of solutions that are going to compound the problem. Because let's be very clear, and that you know brings me back also to the sleep leapfrogging question that you asked me earlier. We're facing, we're, we've entered, I'll be also very honest, I hate to be Cassandra's on panels, but that's just the way it is. Um, we're, we've entered the era of wickedness. To the problems that we're facing, there's never going to be one silver bullet, easy, clean solution. There's going to be a lot of different choices that we need to navigate and which we'll need to mitigate over time. And when it comes to this technology question, coupled with the decarbonization, as I was saying, because we're actually relying on the same kind of raw materials, we're looking at a picture going forward. And this is a conversation that we're not having in the European Union, the US or anywhere else, in, except in very small technical pockets. We're looking at a picture where we're actually, actually going to um, double or triple our demand for raw materials such as rare earths, which China massively invested in over the last 20 years. And in Europe and in the US, we were extremely happy to actually outsource environmental pollution to China. 
which has suffered tremendous health, environmental and social consequences in certain provinces as a result of the demand for decarbonized products, technological products in the developed world. And now we're facing a transition where we're actually going to increase this demand exponentially and even China today, which is still, you know, managing and navigating its own sort of economic rise, industrial rise. So it makes logical sense if we, you know, follow the, the economic logic for them to keep in, in brown energies, but it also makes sense for them to keep on um, looking for the next wave or the next territories where they can extract those materials. And we're doing the same, right? So they are doing it through the Belt and Road Initiative which spans a huge amount of the globe and you know our development or partnership um, sort of uh, agreements very much pale in comparison to the type of, uh, of agreements that they, that they are trying to put into place. And at the heart of this new type of international expansion, at the heart of this new petition, we find you know this, this race for the new raw materials that we need lithium, um, bauxite, cobalt, all the rare earths. And we're facing a fundamental tension, a really wicked problem, which is that outside of China, those raw materials are actually located in the critical ecosystems that are meant to regulate the global climate regime. In short, because we're so focused on a decarbonized climate transition, which is necessary, we are missing out the complexity of ecology, whereby the carbon cycle is also associated to the hydrological cycle, where it's associated to biodiversity. Even today, the IPBES and the IPCC for the very first time have issued uh, a report, which is essentially says you either solve the climate crisis and the biodiversity or environmental crisis together, or you don't. And yet, because of the climate transitions that we are opting for, we are going to accelerate essentially the collapse of biodiversity and more ecological crises. And we may be seeing you know, even more deforestation and um, environmental destruction because of extractive mining in areas such as the Amazon, such as the Congo Basin, such as the deep seas in Myanmar, in Indonesia, in all of the areas which are essentially between the two tropics. These are um, conversations that we're not having because indeed at the heart of it, we're talking about a new type of geopolitical competition and balance of power, which is, which is still showing that for all of our efforts, unfortunately, we're still path dependent. We're still um, very much pursuing the same type of logic that have created the climate and biodiversity crisis in the first place. This is the most fundamental issue that we need to drive to and that we need to address, except that it requires a whole new level of diplomacy at a time when indeed um, China having the territory, having the population size that it does, having um, you know, the, the access to certain resources that it does, having the access to seas and to, you know, like, and, and, and to partnerships that it does represent essentially this, this new market, which is you know, giving a new type of, um, of narrative about what, dem like, about what governance should look like, about what multilateralism should look like and what kind of growth we should be having. And this is why there is a fundamental tension at the moment between on the one hand, you know, like all countries realizing to a certain extent that there is a need to look at the planet through an ecological lens, not just through an economic one. And yet at the same time, not quite identifying how we can reconcile the urgency and therefore the diplomatic actions that are needed in terms of ecological action it's the fact that we're still um, battling with different ideas, essentially. So there's still a lot more work that needs to happen in, in this regard. And the European Union, again, for all of its weaknesses and its faults, does have an interesting position in the middle of, uh, of the US and China. Um, and, and that brings me to the very last question. And I'll try to not babble too much, especially, I don't, is, is Eva back or? Eva is no, still. okay. Um, the, the strength of the European Union um, lies obviously in its notion of the collective, the collective at home, but also the collective with a number of regions 
that hold indeed a lot of potential for how do we reinvent development patterns or development pathways? How do we reinvent um, you know, the notion of economic and social fabrics at a time when we need to add this ecological dimension? So one of the key aspects for the EU and naturally also for uh, the US going forward especially on the road to COP26, and especially in the light of the fallout of the pandemic, is to focus on African partners, on Latin American partners, Central Asian partners, and on the MENA region. I would put very much of an emphasis on African partners because the EU, I think, is... Uh, there is a realization essentially that the EU is, uh, for the moment, missing the mark with its partnerships with Africa. It's still focused on these two priorities of decarbonization and digitalization. And some countries in Africa resonate with that. Rwanda, for example. Um, but the large majority of African partners are not at a level of development where they can actually embrace and leapfrog themselves in the way that China may be doing um, towards digitalization and decarbonization. We need, to, we need to actually really listen once again to the, re, the various and very complex realities of African partners and see how they can, how we can work together towards um, transitions that make sense that do satisfy also the need for growth in the African continent and maybe some targeted degrowth in, in Europe. Um, in the US, I'm not even mentioning it because it's a taboo word anyways. Um, and, uh, and how to really sort of uh, look into the, the road to COP26. And one of the very first things, uh, as I was saying, as a result of, um, of the pandemic is to really sort of insist even more on vaccine diplomacy because there's been a huge breach of trust, um, which, is reminiscent of what is happening with the climate transition, right? We're talking about, let's leave no one behind, but in reality, this is not what's happening. Um, let me also come into that. Uh, if I still not there, you are um, very much invited to raise your hand and uh, or, uh, ask a question. I see that one question was asked, um, US, EU and China are competing for clean technologies that reduce carbon economy. Is there any process global to ensure access to developing countries to those technologies to ensure a fair transition? But a little bit you have been answering, at least in, in, in like describing the problem. Let me just also try to, to go back to, um, to the, the topic of, of this uh, conversation which is after Trump, what happens? And if I understand you correct, um, and I actually share, it's in, I share this analysis is that, well, we have a competition between maybe these three blocks right now, also in, in, in terms of, of climate policy in many different kind of standard setting who, you know, it's a, it's a hegemonic uh, debate, <laughs> let's, let's call it like this. Um, and it seems that Trump, was basically saying, look, I don't believe uh, that the US can win when it comes to uh, climate. So we are basically out of this game. We do not want to, um, um, to, to change. Um, he believes that, um, uh, well, with coal uh, and, and, and oil, they are better off than with going uh, climate neutral. Um, so, so they are out of it. Um, now, basically, um, the US is back. Uh, the, the global competition is still there. So now Biden is going the, the actual, the other way around and says, no, we want to be the first. <laughs> um, it's, it's America first. So we want to be the first uh, in being climate neutral. So we put a lot of uh, money uh, into our industry to become climate neutral, to produce the, um, well, to, to, to be the first uh, in, the, in the climate neutral world and then um, not being overtaken in new technologies by China uh, or the US, but it's now, it's uh, it, at EU, but it's the US now that, um, that is doing that. And in, 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 uh, in essence, the EU is saying the same. It's like, we want to be the first climate neutral uh, continent. We want to be the, uh, I mean, the, the last industrial revolution of digitalization did not happen in, in Europe. The, all of the big uh, tech giants, they are not in Europe. So like industry uh, is the kind of the last base where, where Europe has a, has a lead. Uh, and if we are losing our lead on industry, 
uh, by not uh, transforming fast enough, uh, then we basically are nowhere. <laughs> so we have to be fast in that. And China says, well, um, in our long-term plan by 2040, we are anyway the, the next hegemon. So we, we have to do it. <laughs> and in the and and what is forgotten is the rest of the world. <laughs> um, that um, that basically is uh, only uh, envisioned as a, a, a provider of uh, like clean green hydrogen or other uh, uh, resources. Um, um, but there is no idea of um, of of constructing it in a fair way, and it's a little bit against the whole idea of the Paris Agreement, which is forcing us in a cooperative way you know like it's uh, any country can block so you have to cooperate between each other and here to the realm of competition between the, 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 the three different blocks now um what the what we also demand actually it's, it's also very difficult because we greens and many demand to have uh, this carbon border adjustment tax so it's something like a, a yeah a, a, a carbon border um 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 how do you say like a, a trade label so so an import tax um, that, of course, makes it more difficult for countries um, that are not decarbonized yet, like, uh, you know, transition countries to export to Europe. So it makes their development harder. Uh, but we're not thinking about it. Um, it. Even like, I mean, that's maybe I, I heard this argument from uh, from some people that say, look, what happens to Nigeria if we do not import oil and gas anymore? I mean, uh, this country lives from 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 exporting oil and gas, and still this is like very poor, and it's kind of a, um, um, a, a that uh, that does not distribute the revenues from oil and gas. Still, kind of the infrastructure, everything is built on, on oil and gas revenues. So what happens to them? No one is thinking about it. No one is thinking about like other uh, uh, oil exporting and 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 countries. So this is a big <laughs> like. Uh, uh, a big lack of um, of uh, of uh, thoughts when looking onto global justice, um, and um, and still in the on the uh, in the Paris Agreement we say that we should give one bi one hundred billion dollars every year for to developing countries. We do not do that right now, and also transfer technology as uh, as Jesus was uh, 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 was was pointing out, which also currently the idea is. It's more like, okay, we want to be the ones who are developing the new technology and we do not want to give them away because that gives us global leadership. And um, so, yeah, maybe uh, taking it back to you, Olivia, how do we that? How do we, how do we make it, uh, get this in a global justice way, taking everyone uh, uh, with not only kind of having hegemons competing amongst themselves and basically stamping on the rest of the, <laughs> of the people? It's a very good question. And again, I mean, I, I wish, I so desperately wish that I had a, a simple answer. <laughs> um, but, um, I think so. Okay, let's, let's take it back for a moment to the European Union. Um, first, the Green Deal was, um, and it was said by, uh, by President von der Leyen, on her uh, man on the moon speech, um, the Green Deal is was thought by Europeans, Europeans, um, and as a result, there's been a lot of focus on the internal or regional dimension of the Green Deal. Right, the external dimension of the deal um, is only emerging now. There's been a lot more thinking within the institutions and within the satellite um, organizations around the institutions to sort of say, well, yes, of course, I mean, yes, let's let's decarbonize and let's um, sort of, you know, have a strategy. But really, what does it mean in terms of Europe's place in the world and Europe's relations, relationships with the world? So there's been, uh, th there is a start of a conversation um, in the parliament, in the external action service, in the commission. But what it would mean, you know, in terms of relationships, for example, with Russia, this is one of the very first uh, strategic points because obviously there's there may be a lot of um, rocky bumps ahead in our relationship with, with Russia in a number of accounts. But indeed also, what does it mean with Nigeria, with Algeria? 
um, with Libya, with um, Saudi Arabia, with the United Arab Emirates? What, how does it change essentially the geopolitical power composition of certain regions and the, the, the political equilibriums within countries like Nigeria? There is an answer um, which sort of looks at the bright side, which is essentially, well, if you deconstruct um, the sources of power, quite, quite literally, um, economic power, energy power, political power, then there is an opportunity essentially to re-engage with those countries in a different way, right? And to maybe even, if we do things right, and that requires quite, again, a lot of efforts, a lot of um, analysis, a lot of strategic planning and scenario building, how do we contribute to also uh, better stabilization, healthier political and social contracts in, in some countries? And in places like Algeria and, and Nigeria, these conversations are very, very much needed. Um, so the European Union does have a lot of tools at its disposal between the diplomatic service, the fact that you know, we have a lot of delegations around the world which allow you know, to have you know, constant analysis and with the new NDK, the new um, uh, multi-annual annual, uh, financial program um, until 2027, there um, is a lot more effort and uh, analytical tools going into a number of countries. For example, you know, what used to be DEFCO, what is now INPA, went from being asked to do like three to four conflict analysis per year to you know, now being asked to do like 60, um, which requires a lot more energy, a lot more equipment, a lot more capacity. But that means essentially that there is also a realization that fragility across the world is now built into the system. Um, and that this is a reality that we need to face and we need to get better at understanding the root drivers, the causes behind fragility. And obviously climate disruptions are going to play into that, exacerbating fragility. Um, so the, 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 what I'm trying to demonstrate is essentially that even though the external dimension of the Green Deal was not thought through and, um, and it has implications also for how we do the Green Deal at home, we do have a number of, of, of tools and, and financial as well as policy processes in place to try and look at this external dimension. Our challenge is rather one of coordination, harmonization, uh, multi-competency sort of analysis and therefore design rather than not having anything at our dis disposal to look at what is happening outside of the European Union. And at the end of the day, the fact that we do have, you know, a high level, uh, a high volume rather of um, financial aid within the development partnerships is one tremendous asset, particularly compared to uh, the US, which has re-increased its commitments under the Biden administration, but we're still falling quite short. I think that out of $1, we're talking about 30 cents or 20 cents going to, uh, to, to foreign aid or development aid. And the UK also, I mean, it's worth mentioning mentioning here, having tremendously dismantled its uh, development uh, UK aid budget in, in, in under the Johnson administration. So um, th there is a capacity essentially for the EU to engage positively and constructively with partners across the world, um, but it does require a lot more coordination. And for that matter, I think One of the interesting um, aspects in the European Union is that indeed there's a lot of different movements happening maybe outside of the institutions, but uh, that try to influence and pressure the institutions that are connected to networks also in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, raising you know, some voices about uh, coming from citizenry, saying we need to move faster. The, the, once again, and I will insist on that, um, If I refer back to this uh, conversation around, you know, a, a tremendous focus on CO2 and decarbonization has led us to actually simplify the problem to the extent that we're actually creating more problems for ourselves. Um, and this is a this is a conversation that even civil society actors or citizenship actors haven't really picked up upon. Um, so uh, there's been a response, you know, from the institutions, for example, to the 
Friday for Future movements um, and a number of other movements saying, yes, we need to decarbonize and yes, we're moving in direction and yes, we're listening to you um, across Europe, across the world. But it has created, you know, like the, the, the institutions particularly should be in charge indeed of seeing those blind spots and the complexities of the, tra the transition. We're, we have to because we're running into such a zone of danger um, overshooting into, you know, other planetary boundaries that um, the, the, I understand at times, you know, the, this caution of the European institutions to sort of try to move little by little, but at the same time, it's, we need to respond to the urgency. I hope that I'm making sense. It makes sense. Um, let me, let me uh, try to give maybe two, uh, or three thoughts uh, at the end of this conversation that that I hope that will give us hope for the future. The first is, uh, and I thank thank you for bringing it in. I mean, the like what like the end of the Trump or uh, of 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 the Trump area. I think it has brought some other things uh, that are really encouraging. First is as you said, Fridays and Fridays for Future movement. Um, it, may mean it had it had its peak um, maybe two years ago, um, and now with the pandemic, it, it became less and less. Uh, uh, well, how do you say, like active on the streets, but they're really focused on global justice and 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 global issues are really important. So you know how often they are actually talking about people in in most affected areas bringing their voices to um to 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 the west i think that's that's really interesting it's kind of part of uh, of becoming more connected and also like voices that have not been heard before that were silenced that uh, that that are now being put more um uh, in the into placed into the debate uh, in kind of centers of power so that's that's great second um is what I think is very interesting is to see uh, a calling for the trips waiver of the US administration. And, um, and also actually I, I can report to you um, yesterday, the European parliament also voted with one vote. Um, so it was, I think 325 to 324 in favor of calling for a trips waiver, um, which I think is very, very interesting because it's some kind of, of new like global regime of, of, of solidarity and, and technological solidarity. Um, and if we can see something like this, like uh, um, in terms of, I mean, TRIPS is about intellectual property rights, technological trans uh, uh, transfers, there are about intellectual property rights. Yeah. And if we understand, like we understood in, now in the pandemic, that it's actually better for our societies to take away the intellectual property right of maybe one company for the better of the whole humanity. And so we, our societies, also Western societies benefit from it. In the same way, we need to understand that if we make more, like now I'm sorry, I'm in the technological fix idea, but if we give more like technological transfers, but also investments in the South for climate neutral, for um, renewable technology, um, that, because that's for the better for of all of our societies. Uh, the costs for European societies or for use they will will fall with more uh, transfer to the global south because um, because uh, um, they they will be able to reduce the emissions much faster. So I think so, so this kind of ideas that the climate crisis as the pandemic kind of placed us into a situation where. Um, um, where it is actually there is a need for cooperation because only cooperation will bring us the biggest benefit. <laughs> so that may be that kind of new setting um, is driving us for cooperation. And I think um, so the change is not only there, but with um, with the, the same is true for the uh, minimum standard uh, for taxation that G7 is now bringing forward. Um, so so there is kind of some kind of new maybe era of cooperation that we are forced into by a pandemic and by kind of a global problem like the climate crisis that hits all of us. And so maybe um, um, having understood this, I'm not sure that our societies learned that already, I'm really not sure, um, can then we can say that maybe hopefully Trump was kind of the last idea of nationalism and now the era of uh, cooperation starts because we are, understand as societies that we can only 
uh, um, um, win if we cooperate. If that works, we will see. But um, um, now it's also uh, already one hour. So unfortunately, Eva could not come. Um, she she really apologizes um, that uh, that she could not connect anymore. Her her computer broke down. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I did a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Olivia. It was really a pleasure um, to to hear your thoughts. And yeah, you, as you can see uh, now, um, I, my uh, parental duties start. So I also have to leave you. And um, I hope you have a good evening. And I hope we will see each other soon to discuss about progressive ideas in the European Forum. Thanks a lot. And bye bye. Thank you, Michael.